Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Classes of Mail. My name is Alan Gigax, and it is time to get back to work. I've had a big series of podcasts from the convention, and they're actually still more in the can. I still have at least two more that I have to publish from the convention, and they're both great. Everything from that convention, I mean, aside from the revol- results of some of the votes, everything from the convention was pretty awesome. So there will be more about that in the future. Uh, some interesting things happened on a personal level at the convention as well, which I'll talk about at some point. But for now, dude, there's enough preamble. Speaking of preamble, let's uh, let's get to the NALC Constitution. Remember that uh, season four is all about how we treat each other and how we take care of each other and how we make sure we're doing right by each other. And that means being proper members and stewards um, stewards in the sense of like taking care of things of our union. So let's get started. We start our NALC constitution. I'm going to skip the names of all the officers and such, such that are on the first few pages, and we'll get right into article one names, powers, and objectives. Section one, this labor organization here and after referred to as the union shall be known as the NASA. National Association of Letter Carriers of the United States of America, and shall be identified by the initials NALC. Section 2. This document shall be known as the Constitution of the National Association of Letter Carriers, Constitution for the Government of Subordinate and Federal Branches, Constitution for the Government of State Associations, Constitution and General Laws of the United States Letter Carriers Mutual Benefit Association and Health Benefit Plan. Section 3. The union shall have jurisdiction to make its own constitution, rules of discipline, and general laws of the United States Letter Carriers Mutual Benefit Association and Health Benefit Plan. So this one, Section 3, is where the union grants itself its own powers. That's that's where they come from. Section 4. The National Convention shall be the supreme body to which final appeal shall be made on all matters emanating from members, branches, and state associations. There shall be no geographical limitations on the jurisdiction of the union. This section was a major issue at the last national convention that that just finished in 2024 because Brian Renfro had made a decision about whether or not the the national convention would be able to hear the charges that were being proffered against him. And he said, no, no, you can't hear the charges that are being proffered against me. And, of course, that decision came off as, uh, uh, let's call it self-serving. So the assembled body took the power back into their own hands, and they said, no, we are the supreme body, and we will decide whether we want to hear those charges or not. And we did. And we did. We wanted to hear those charges. And so those charges were heard. And that was a... um, that was a good step toward making sure that this union is not an autocracy. All right, section five. The objects of the association shall be to unite all letter carriers and other employees of the Postal Service for their mutual benefit, to obtain and secure our rights as employees of the United States Postal Service, and to strive at all times to promote the safety and welfare of every member. In conjunction with the Postal Service, to strive for the constant improvement of the service, to create and establish the NALC Life Insurance Department and the NALC Health Benefit Department, to construct, maintain, and operate the NALC NALC buildings in the city of Washington, D.C. and other localities, to establish a non-contributory retirement program for officers and employees, to sponsor a nonprofit retirement housing facility in East Lake, Wales, Florida, to be owned and operated by the National Association of Letter Carriers, Retirement Educational Security Training Incorporated, also known as NALCREST, and to establish and operate, under the rules adopted and promulgated by the National Executive Council, a fund composed wholly of voluntary contributions by the membership to be used at the national and local levels exclusively for the purpose of assisting candidates without regard to party affiliation to federal office who favor legislation in the interest of labor, said fund to be separate and apart from all other monies and funds of the union. So this last part of Article 1 is about the uh, letter carrier political fund. 
By the way, I recommend that you donate to the Letter Carrier Political Fund. The swag is pretty good. Right now I'm drinking from a mug that I picked up at the convention. There you go. That's the sound of this double wall steel mug. Uh, The swag is really good. And the shirt that I got from them is also really good. But more importantly, we need to protect our interests legislatively. You know, we're not like other businesses that can largely operate the way they see fit. Almost everything we do is is governed by legislation. And so it's important that we uh, play the game. You know, it's it's distasteful that legislation is often decided by money or access to politicians is decided by money. But that is the world in which we live. And so rather than denying that and pretending that's not the case, we should donate to the Letter Carrier Political Fund. I absolutely recommend it. You know, whatever you can swing, if it's $5 a paycheck, you're probably not going to miss that $5 once it's gone, and it really does help, or at least that's the idea. Uh, To go back to um, earlier in Section 5 of Article 1, it says that we're supposed to um, unite letter carriers for our mutual benefit and to promote safety and welfare of every member. So at my station, I agitated to get an ice machine. It is ludicrously hot in the summer in Las Vegas, and we had carriers hospitalized. And, of course, last year, Brother Gates died from the heat. This year, a supervisor died from the heat, Uh, neither in Las Vegas, but, but still. And so I wanted us to get an ice machine. And I remember getting resistance. Honestly, there was only one person in my office who gave resistance But her position was that it was inappropriate for the union to be doing something like that. Uh, It's not in the contract. And the union should limit itself to only arguing for things that are in the contract. And my position was, look, I'm not filing a grievance on our lack of an ice machine. Maybe I could have, but but I didn't. I am agitating for better conditions. And that's what's laid out here in Section 5. You know, our mutual benefit, the safety and welfare of every member. That's the union that I joined, and that's what I was fighting for in that situation. And because we are a union and because we banded together, we won. We got that ice machine, and that was a sweet victory for our station and a real testament to what can be achieved through solidarity. There's no way I could have got that ice machine on my own. We only got it by banding together. And that's what the union's all about. All right, moving on. That is the end of Article 1. Article 2, branches, state associations, membership. Section 1, membership in the National Association of Letter Carriers shall be open without regard to race, creed, color, sex, national origin, age, religion, handicap, or marital status. Membership shall be... A, regular branch members who shall be non-supervisory employees in the Postal Service and regular branch members who the Executive Council has determined were unjustly separated from the Postal Service. Retirees from that service who were regular members of the NALC when they retired and persons leaving the service with coverage under Office of Workers' Compensation Programs, OWCP. Such retirees, OWCP departees, and non-letter carrier regular members shall have no voice or vote in any manner pertaining to the ratification of a national working agreement, local memorandum of understanding, or proposed work stoppage. All right, so my interpretation of what this means is if you are a retiree, you don't get to vote when the new contract comes in on whether or not we're going to ratify it, and that seems reasonable. And you don't vote for the LMOU because it doesn't apply to you. You're already retired, you know, or you left with workers comp or whatever. So that's what is covered in part A. B. Oh, these are now getting back to it. These are more people who are considered uh, part of the NALC, members of the NALC. B. Present members of existing federal branches may retain their membership. C. Present members who have left the Postal Service or have been temporarily or permanently promoted to supervisory status may retain their membership, but shall be members only for the purpose of membership in the NALC Life Insurance Plan and or the NALC Health Benefit Plan. These members shall have no voice or vote in any of the affairs of the branch, except that they shall have a voice and vote at the branch level upon matters 
appertaining to the NALC life insurance plan and or the NALC health benefit plan if they are a member thereof and on any proposition to raise dues. These members are not eligible to be candidates for any state association, branch, or national office, or delegates to any conventions. They may attend only that part of the meeting which concerns them, such as change of dues structure and information concerning health or life insurance. Now, Part A laid out retirees, um, retirees that uh, from the service that were regular members when they retired. Part C says present members who have left the Postal Service. So that must be something separate, like left other than retiring. You know, so you left like you left to go get another job or something, but not retirees. This is actually something that Michael and I have had a lot of discussions about parsing this language. But retirees are covered in Part A, and uh, Part C is about people who just left uh, generally. All right, D, a Form 1187 dues checkoff provision must be signed and filed by all applicants seeking membership within the NALC. E, a Form 1189 dues checkoff provision must be signed by all retiring members within the NALC who wish to retain their membership in said organization, effective October 1st, 1982. So this is where we get to the first change that I'm aware of from the latest convention. Uh, the constitution that I'm reading does not have the changes. They were, they were pretty minor, but this is one of them where now um, there is no longer like a time limit to get back into the NALC. If you retired and you were in good standing when you retired and then you forget to fill out your 1189 or, or something happens, you can always get back into the union. And so, again, that's a, that's a new change. F, upon proper execution and receipt of Form 1187, the new member shall be provided by the NALC with a complimentary copy of the current national agreement and NALC constitution. Section 2, all members of the National Association... Hold on a sec. I'm going to go back here to F. So... It says here that when you become a member of the NALC, you get a complimentary copy of the current national agreement and NALC constitution. So I don't know what form this takes. Like, is the local branch supposed to give it to you or does the NALC mail it to you with some welcome papers? If you are a reasonably new CCA and you remember getting this, the national agreement and the constitution, uh, let me know. Let me know how you got it. Was it handed to you at orientation by the union person or did you not get it at all? Because that's what happens with, like with my local union. We have in our bylaws that everybody who joins the union gets a copy of the bylaws, but that doesn't happen. They don't do it. We're violating our own bylaws. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm running for vice president. So when we get to the bylaws, I'll talk about that stuff, but yeah, so anyway, if you are new and you got this, uh, these copies of the National Agreement and Constitution, drop me an email, classesandmail at gmail.com. Let me know what form that took or how you got it. Or if you didn't get it. Section 2. All members of the National Association of Letter Carriers shall be affiliated with a subordinate branch and with the state association if one exists in the state in which their branch shall have jurisdiction over members working under one or more postmasters as determined by the branch charter. So, for example, I am in branch 2502 in Las Vegas, and there are, I think, four postmasters. There's the Las Vegas postmaster, the North Las Vegas, the Henderson, and the Boulder City postmasters, all of which deal with branch 2502. And then we're part of the Nevada State Association of Letter Carriers. In the event the Postal Service shall combine one or more offices into one with a single postmaster, the smaller branch or branches shall be merged with the larger branch into one branch, provided the provisions of Article 2, Section 3E are complied with. Boy, this, is, this was a big issue that came up at the convention because this is what it says in the Constitution, but Renfro had a, a directive that said that when two when multiple offices branch or merge i should say when multiple branches merge if they're merging into an s and d c a sorting and delivery center then if there were already carriers in that building then that union becomes the gaining installer or that the gaining union and 
you know, everybody is now part of that union. And then it happened that a much bigger union got merged into a building that already had a smaller union in it, and it didn't go that way. It didn't go the way uh, that was laid out in uh, Renfro's directive. Instead, it went in a way that was laid out here in Section 2, where the bigger one essentially absorbs the smaller one. And man, that the guy who runs the smaller branch... He was real upset, and in my opinion, for good reason. Um, and, uh, yeah, Renfro did not give a satisfying answer to why, uh, essentially, these things are in conflict. All right, moving on. The number, of NA- the number of any NALC members in the branch will determine which is the largest. When the Postal Service shall separate one office into more than one office, the following shall apply. The smaller minority of these groups shall have the option, by majority vote, to continue their membership in the original subordinate branch and also may form a subordinate branch or affiliate with a subordinate branch in the adjacent city. Section 3. Mergers of branches may be affected only in accordance with the following rules and regulations. A. Each branch proposing to merge shall, within a period of 90 days, have a regular or special meeting. Such meetings shall be held for the purpose of of considering a resolution calling for merger after at least 30 days' notice of said meeting to each member, which notice shall set forth the details of the proposed merger. B. When a merger is formally voted upon and put into effect, it will be final and binding. C. The identity and geographic area covered by the branch will emerge from, oh, which will emerge from, or the name and number of the branch which will survive, the merger or absorption shall be determined. Um, let me let me read that again, or I'm just going to summarize what I read because I know I read it poorly. Um, when you c- create this new branch, or when you separate out, or whatever, then you decide like what your new branch number will be and what your new geographic designation will be, or you keep one of the existing branch numbers and designations. Incidentally, at the convention, I noticed that a number of branches have nicknames. Like there was one from Florida where the space launches happened called the Space Coast Branch. And there was one from Pennsylvania called the Keystone Branch. And I think that's really cool. I like the idea of having a nickname for your branch. Branch 2502 just doesn't have that same catchiness to it. D, any agreement or agreements between the applying branches concerning bylaws, due structure, terms, and identity of officers disposition of assets, assumption of liabilities, if any, and proposed effective date of the merger or absorption shall be specified. E, a majority affirmative vote of all regular members in good standing, present and voting, of each branch proposing to merge shall be necessary to authorize application for merger. F, an application to the president of the NALC signed by the president and secretary of each branch proposing to merge containing the following a copy of the resolution adopted by each branch, a certification by each branch secretary of the vote of their branch, including the date and place of its meeting, the number of its eligible voters, and the number of affirmative votes cast, and a statement of the reasons for desiring the merger. G. Upon receipt by the president of an application for merger on appropriate form from two more two or more branches, the president of the NALC shall issue a charter forthwith. I like that word forthwith. Going to use that more often. That means like right away. H. Merger applications will be considered in the light of the following criteria, among others. All mergers will be on a voluntary basis. So this is another one that um, that the, the guy in, uh, at the convention would have taken issue with, I think. Uh, a merger may not cross the geographic boundary lines of a state unless a consolidation of post offices across state lines puts the branches under one installation head. Uh, And then we have subletter I. If a substantial complaint is raised during uh, following branch merger voting, documentation and supporting evidence of the charge or charges must be submitted to the national president within 30 days after such voting, who will in turn have the authority upon review to order a new vote to be taken among all members in each representative branch seeking merger in accordance with the voting procedures as contained in the bylaws of each respective branch and the national constitution. So I guess that's how those disputes would eventually get settled. 
uh, which probably also means that the larger branch would win out. Section 4. All members of branches within the geographic boundary lines of a state, except in states without a state association, must be affiliated within the state association under the name and title Blank State Association of Letter Carriers. The Colorado State Association of Letter Carriers has a podcast. It's called, um, what is it called? The Bipartisan Buzz. And uh, I listen to that podcast and, oh, shoot, hey, tomorrow morning is coffee with the Colorado State Association of Letter Carriers. They call it COLSAC, C-O-L-S-A-C, even though the initials are actually C-O-S-L-A-C. But that's okay. It's just like Brett Favre, right? It's not pronounced the way it's spelled. <laughs> Section five, A, when a brand, uh, when a, you know, sometimes I distract myself too much. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. Section five, A, when receiving proper notification by the branch secretary that a member will complete 25 years or 30 years or 35 years or 40 years and 45 years of membership, the National Association of Letter Carriers shall provide a suitable lapel pin to such member. In the year when a member is to complete 50 years membership in this association and by proper request having been directed by the branch secretary to the National Secretary Treasurer, a member shall be given a life membership card of gold which shall entitle them to all privileges of membership in the National Association of Letter Carriers without payment of dues, per capita tax, or special assessments from the date of issue of such life membership card. Provided, however, that a life member shall not be exempt from the requirements of premium payments to the Mutual Benefit Association or the Health Benefit Plan. Life members shall also be issued a suitable lapel pen. The life membership card and the lapel pin shall be issued by the National Association through the office of the National President. B. In the year when a member is to complete 55 years, 60 years, and 65 years, and when receiving proper notification by the branch secretary, the National Association of Letter Carriers shall provide a suitable lapel pin to such member. C. In the year when a member is to complete 70 and 75 years, and when receiving proper notification by the branch secretary, the National Association of Letter Carriers shall provide a suitable plaque for such member. D. For purposes of, of this Article 2, Section 5, membership in the National Alliance of Postal Employees prior to January 1, 1969, shall be treated as equivalent to membership in the National Association of Letter Carriers. Article 2, Section 5 shall also apply to any members who were denied NALC membership after January 1st, 1969 and joined the National Alliance of Postal Employees. And thus ends Article 2. Next, we will move on to Article 3, Time and Place of Conventions and Special Meetings. Section 1, the National Convention of this Union shall be held biennially in even-numbered years between the 4th of July and the third full week of August. That, of course, refers to the National Convention that just took place. The next one will be in Los Angeles. The time and place of the convention to be held in the year 2020 and all subsequent conventions will be determined by the Executive Council of the National Association of Letter Carriers, eliminating the sites of the two previous conventions. So you can't have back-to-back -back or vice versa or within two conventions. And they were saying at the convention this year that they try to have it geographically varied. So one be toward the East coast, the other one next one be toward the West coast and back and forth and so on. So this year was Boston. Next convention is Los Angeles. Then it will be in Minnesota, which I guess is kind of in the middle, but it counts for the West coast, East for these purposes. And then the one after that, which was announced at the convention will be in Hawaii. So that's pretty cool because Hawaii got boned uh, during COVID when they were supposed to host the convention, and then we couldn't have the convention. So Hawaii gets their shot again. And also, um, at the announcement of that location, the president of Branch 2502, my branch, uh, long-serving president Glenn Norton, uh, he was our president for 17 years, and he was on the site selection committee and he died earlier this year while still holding office. And the NELC did a really nice um, tribute to him during that selection process. It was a, it was a cool moment. 
All right, so moving on. Uh, any materials and or literature distributed at a national convention must bear a union label. After a convention city has thus been selected, all further arrangements for the conduct of the convention, the costs of which shall be borne by the National Convention Fund, shall be under the supervision and authority of the Executive Council of the National Association of Letter Carriers. Section 2. Special meetings shall be called by the President upon the written request of not less than one-half of all the branches representing not less than two-thirds of this membership of the National Association of Letter Carriers. The Secretary-Treasurer shall notify by letter each branch entitled to representation in the National Association of Letter Carriers and also every member by a general notice printed in the postal record stating the object of the call. No other business shall be transacted at said special meeting. All right, so um, I guess we can call like a special convention, essentially, that if there's this pressing issue and enough branches uh, representing enough members demand it, then we will have this special meeting. Moving on, if the object of the call is to raise per capita tax or to levy a general or special assessment on members, the secretary shall send the aforesaid notice no less than 30 days before the meeting is convened. Section 3. 300 delegates from branches in not less than 10 states representing at least 8% of the branches having an aggregate membership of at least 15% of the members of the NALC, as shown by the records in the Office of the National Secretary Treasurer as of January of the current year, shall constitute a quorum, but less than that number may adjourn to meet at a future specified time. So, yeah, not only do we have to call this meeting and enough people have to call for the meeting, but then enough people have to attend in order for that meeting to be valid. Under Robert's Rules of Order, which I learned in order to go to the convention, um, you can't conduct business unless there's a quorum. And your bylaw should indicate what constitutes a quorum, like how many people have to be present for there to be a quorum. And that's what Section 3 is here, 300 delegates of the makeup that it that it said. Section 4. A. National business agents shall have the authority to conduct RAP sessions in their respective regions consistent with the needs of the area served as determined by them. B. The national president shall, once each year except in the year of the national convention, call a national conference. This conference shall be voluntarily attended by only state and branch presidents or their designees with their expenses to be borne by the state association or branch represented. So that must be the committee of presidents meetings. And then, um, the, yeah, the rap sessions. Um, I went to my first rap session earlier this year, and I got to ask Renfro a question about what are we asking for as starting pay. And he said uh, it was the amount in table one. Even then, he wouldn't say what the amount was, you know, even though he'll tell – the person negotiating on behalf of the post office, hey, this is what we want, he won't tell us. And even there, he was still circumspect about it. He just said it was the amount in table one, which I had to look up, and it's like $31 an hour. So hopefully we get that. Who knows? All right. Um, that is the end of Article 3, and we are at the half-hour mark. Eh, Article 4 is short. I'm going to go ahead and read Article 4 as well. Delegates to the convention. Section 1. Each branch having 20 or less members shall be entitled to one delegate and one vote in the National Convention. Branches having more than 20 members shall be entitled to one delegate and one vote for each 20 members or fraction thereof. Each state association shall be entitled to two delegates at large. National officers and delegates at large shall be entitled to one vote as such provided that the vote may not be cast for officers. Each delegate shall be supplied with a certificate of election signed by the president and recording secretary of the branch. All right, so that means that my branch, which has 1,600 members, could send as many as 80 delegates to the convention. And that's going to be one of my goals going into Los Angeles is to get, A, as many delegates as possible, and B, as many young people and new carriers as possible to represent the real struggles that are happening on the workroom floor. When we get into our bylaws, or maybe it's in the sub subordinate branch rules, uh, we'll talk about what it takes to be a delegate, how you get nominated uh, as a delegate, or how you qualify to be a delegate. But for now, 
Uh, it's one delegate for every 20 members. Section 2. Each delegate shall serve from the biennial meeting of the National Association succeeding their election until the next biennial meeting. So I guess when you're a delegate, you count as a delegate until the next meeting comes. Section 3. At the regular election of the branch delegates, or at the regular election of branch delegates, the branch shall elect the same number of alternates as there are delegates elected. And at the election of delegates at large, the state association shall elect also two alternate des uh, delegates at large who shall be recognized as the delegate in the event of the inability of any delegate to attend the convention or of the death or resignation of any delegate. You know, I think our branch had like 15 people attend the convention, maybe 20 out of a potential 80. And so there was no need for alternate delegates. Everybody who wanted to be a delegate was able to be one. The branch may elect both paid and unpaid delegates and alternates as long as every qualified member has an equal opportunity to run for both the paid and unpaid positions, provided that the alternate who received the highest number of votes shall be assigned to act instead of any one delegate who is unable to attend such convention. And when more than one delegate is unable to attend such convention, alternates shall be assigned in accordance with the number of votes cast for each one in the election and shall be certified in such numerical order to act in their stead. A delegate and their alternate shall not both be admitted during any one biennial or special meeting. Any vacancy in the office of delegate, delegate at large, or their alternates may be filled by election by the branch or by the state association. An alternate delegate before being admitted to the national convention shall present either their certificate of election or written evidence from the secretary or their branch of their branch, or from the delegate for whom they are elected alternate, that the elected delegate is unable to attend the meeting of the National Association. Section 4. National officers and delegates at large shall each be entitled to one vote only. The delegates from any branch president or from any branch present at the National Convention shall be allowed to cast the whole number of votes to which the branch is entitled, provided such delegates are unanimously as to who among them shall cast such vote. In case of disagreement, the delegates in attendance shall be entitled to, to such number of whole votes as can be divided equally among them each pro rata. The number of members for whom per capita tax is paid to the National Association for the term beginning October 1st prior to each biennial convention shall determine the number of votes and delegates to which the branch is entitled at such convention. All right, and that ends Article 4. When we come back next time, we're going to pick up with Article 5, which is elections. There is an election coming up in my branch in October and November, so we'll be nominated in October, and I expect to be nominated for the position of vice president, which I am excited about, and then the elections will happen in November. So, vote for me, <laughs> right? All the cool people are going to vote for me. Um, obviously, a lot of you who are listening are not in Las Vegas, and so you won't be able to, but that that's all right. I appreciate your support all the same. Uh, so anyway, when we come back, we're going to talk about elections. And until then, thank you guys for listening. Catch you next time.